Welcome to the Weave Online User Group. Uh, my name is Tama Onakahara. I run the developer experience team at this company, Weaveworks. And we've been doing these Weave Online User Groups uh, every two Tuesdays for now um, uh, this season, I guess uh, about six months, but we've been running this uh, Weave Online User Group now for about three years. So um, if you've been here many times, thanks for joining us again. And we are really lucky to have um, great speakers. We have guest speakers and some speakers from our own company. Uh, and if this is your first time, then welcome. Welcome to the Weave Online User Group. We cover all kinds of topics generally in the Kubernetes space, container space, uh, DevOps, microservices, and in particular, the term that we coined, uh, GitOps. So we've been talking about topics around GitOps. So we're very lucky today to have Michael Hassenblas, who's a developer advocate at AWS, talking about defining and enforcing policies the GitOps way. Uh, we also have Stacy here, who's behind the WeaveWorks logo, who's one of our community managers who uh, creates this whole series. So thanks to Stacy for bringing this to us. So before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. If you're brand new to us, um, a company that Stacy and I work for is WeaveWorks. We're a startup based in San Francisco, London, Berlin, Denver, and New York, as well as with different distributed teams. Uh, if you heard of the technology RabbitMQ, our CEO and founding uh, CTO are the ones who created the technology and the company behind RabbitMQ. Uh, then they got uh, acquired by uh, VMware and then they saw various needs in container space, which led to a variety of open source projects and then products um, that were built around this company, WeaveWorks. Uh, we're a VC funded uh, startup. Uh, we have many, including Excel Partners and others, uh, but I will mention a brief mention to Google Ventures, which is part of our ongoing commitment to this Kubernetes space. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, much of us, much of the work that we did is founded on open source. So if you've heard of us before, it's likely because you've heard one of our many projects that we can't even fit into this slide. Uh, WeaveNet was our potentially our earliest one. Um, it was still today one. It's uh, still today the premier way of uh, networking your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we have Flux and Cortex that are in the CNCF. Uh, Flux, of course, does automated deployments and uh, is kind of what led to this concept of GitOps, or at least the early ideation of it. Uh, and Cortex uh, builds upon Prometheus and uh, helps you make it uh, more scalable and robust. Uh, you might have heard of Flagger, which is one of our newest projects um, that provides like canary deployments as such in a very particularly Kubernetes way. Um, and of course, we've got Michael here, so I should mention um, there's EKS and our work on EKS Cuddle that now has become pretty much the official CLI for EKS. Uh, and we have many, many more, but um, if you're interested, definitely check out our GitHub page, uh, github.com at uh, WeaveWorks. We also do have paid products. Um, our main one that we started with was Weave Cloud, and it is a SaaS uh, product that allows you to do monitoring, management, and automated deployments for your Kubernetes clusters. In some ways, it's a hosted version and, of course, better integrated version um, of some of the components that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we've been running uh, Weave Cloud on Kubernetes on AWS for four years now. So we actually have experience with running uh, Kubernetes in production for four years. Uh, and because of that, uh, we noticed a lot of people were interested in Weave Cloud, but they actually needed a lot more help um, getting started with Kubernetes, um, as well as needing some help. So we decided to productize um, the Weave Kubernetes platform um, that we had created for Weave Cloud. And since obviously now GitOps has become kind of a common parlance, we wanted to make sure that it's a very GitOps aware enterprise platform. So if you're looking to get started with Kubernetes and you want to make sure that you have all these GitOps components on an enterprise level, um, definitely check it out. Um, and we do add some consulting and training and support for people who kind of need to get started or want to get their current Kubernetes experience to a much more GitOps um, aware level. So we offer those things. If you've heard of us, uh, if uh, you hadn't heard of us before, this is our website, weave.works, check it out. And uh, you'll have a follow-up email and you can certainly uh, follow up and ask any other questions that you have. So thanks for listening. Uh, we'll do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we use a platform called Zoom, which I think is fairly pervasive at this point. Uh, again, like I mentioned, we have Michael Hasselblas, who's our speaker, and these sessions usually run between 30 to 45 minutes. In general, with Q&A and such, they go to about 45. Um, if there are tons of questions, we do go over, but we have an absolute hard stop at 60 minutes. Um, but these usually have around 45. 
And if you have questions, please make sure to use the chat box and make sure that you chat to all panelists and attendees so that uh, everybody can see the questions and some people answer questions for other people. Uh, if you can't find the chat button, sometimes hitting escape will get you out of full screen mode and you can see more of the uh, Zoom capabilities. So with that housekeeping, I will hand it over to Michael. All right, Tamara, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure. And I'm going to grab your Yes, let me know if right I need away. to stop sharing. Or <laughs> I think that's oh, fine. Perfect. I think that's fine. Looks great. Can all see me? Yes. Or at least my, my screen there. All right. So um, I'm going to talk about defining and enforcing policies the GitOps way. And really, this is all about OPA, the Open Policy Agent, and how to use it along the supply chain in GitOps. I do work at AWS in the container service team and um, looking after a number of different services we have there. Uh, before that, I was uh, Red Hat, Messersphere, and MapArt and research, and I'm hanging out many different places, many Slack communities, as one does uh, on Twitter, DMs are open, or if you prefer a good old email, feel free. Is that already a question there or? <laughs> No, it's just being, being friendly. Okay. Um, if you want to read books, uh, I also write books. Uh, have a look at that if you're interested in either programming communities uh, using Go or Kubernetes security. And I'm working on a new book uh, around hacking Kubernetes as well. And with that, we get into OPA. So it's two parts. First part is giving you an idea what OPA is all about. And then in the second part, how to actually apply it in a GitOps fashion. So OPA, the Open Policy Agent, is a general purpose policy engine. It's a CNCF incubating project and has many, many integrations from Kubernetes, where it's pretty well known, to WASM, WebAssembly. Now, if you're like me and you hear the first time a general purpose policy engine, you probably wonder what the heck is that, right? That sounds awfully abstract and um, really, yeah, no one really knows what that is about. So let's have a look at concrete, um, the way how it works and concrete examples. And if any one of you stays here tonight, if there's a question already, um, let me know if, if someone has a question on, on chat. I can't really see that here. Yeah, um, I'll be hollering in. <laughs> oh, thanks. So, Essentially, the way how it works is you supply OPA with some policy, some rules in a format called Rego, and some data which has to be chosen. Pretty much everything nowadays can be represented in JSON. It takes both the policy in Rego and the JSON and applies that, coming up with some other JSON value. This JSON value could simply be something like true or false, or it can be something more complex. The main point is that whatever kind of policy you have, you externalize it. You don't do it in your service. You don't hard code it. You explicitly, declaratively have it in your Rego policy here. Now let's have a look at the concrete example. Um, Rego is a general purpose language, but it's not an imperative one. It's not like you know Go or Java or whatever, where you tell exactly what's going on one step after the other. Think more like if you're using CSS or XSLT, if you're old enough or whatever, this kind of pattern matching, right? So you describe something and leave it up to the engine to match the patterns. So let's have a look. You can go uh, afterwards and have a look at that yourself here. They have a wonderful um, playground there. So all of these examples are available online. Um, this is small enough that you can actually directly see it. And if you have a, a guess, what would you think would be the output here, right? So we have um, down here, the data, very simple object that has only one key in here, people with a number of an, an array of, of values in here, string values, names. Um, and here we have a, a rule that is count people returns this total and it counts the input. What would your guess be? Um, we execute that, what would you expect to see there? Any guesses before we click on the resolve button? 
I was told that I think we need to increase that a bit. So that's uh, Rego, that's the, the actual rule here. And with, uh, with yeah, that, six, that's the comment. Um, Kingdon. Six, <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's what you would expect, right? Total is six, right? Very simple way. You can count the uh, number of elements in that array. Very simple. Okay, let's move on to a slightly more exciting one. So this could actually already be a real world example from um, an environment like um, trying to apply uh, OPA in, in a um, GitOps uh, setup. So you have a number of people here. Um, they have a status field here that is called review that could either be available or not available and they have an org right an organization a company they're working with right we have Cheetah there and daniel and jesse and martina and michael and the question here is who is available for review right so someone who is available for review that review field has to be exactly available right and for the or it, the policy that I'm stating here, it has to be either Weaveworks or AWS, right? So I, I want to have either that or that in here. And that's just one way to express it. So looking through that, what would you think would be the outcome here? So this is the way how we return that. Oops. I made a little a little mistake here. Where did I make the mistake? 135. Did I, did I delete something here? Mm -hmm. Oh, that looks good. Data. Okay, so apparently I have to set the data to just uh, empty. Um, the advantage of that. Uh, um, playground is that you can prepare stuff. The disadvantage is that apparently everything is <laughs> exactly uh, set to the way when I published it. Um, so if you see that error, uh, there is another uh, part in there you can embed data um, that has to be zero for the playground or empty in that case. Uh, so in that case, uh, the rule available reviewer gives me um, three reviewers that are um, available. Cool. And one more example. In this case, um, again, could already be useful for, for GitOps. Um, we want to have um, approvals, and that also shows off a little bit of the powerful um, built-in functions that um, Rego has. Uh, in this case, um, network-related, so how to manipulate um, IP uh, ranges or IP. Uh, addresses and time, uh, this tool that, that I'm using here. So I have these uh, approvals here that have been issued from a certain IP and at a certain time. And what I'm asking if we go top down is overall, I want to have more than two, um, or at least two uh, approvals overall. And the way the approvals are structured is that they need to be both in a valid time window and from a valid network IP. So down here you see functions. Um, that's really essentially very, very much self-describing. I'm getting the time. It's all kind of like uh, motivated by Go. Um, and I'm requesting the timestamp I have here, um, converting that into Unix um, epoch uh, is before the current uh, time. I could uh, also say within the last day or whatever, and this would look a bit more complicated. And the network IP uh, is essentially just 
say here from an allowed um, cider range um, if that IP comes from that allowed cider range of course that's a private one that doesn't make sense but for demonstration purposes that's fine um, so in this case I get both um, allowed true by default it's false um, whenever um, it can match something then uh, the, the result is true so I get allowed true here and approvals uh, that's probably more for debugging um, the ones that match here this one here and the last one down here. The others are either from IP ranges that are not um, in the allowed one or they are uh, yeah, the future or, or um, yeah, not, not, uh, not relevant here. So this, just to give you an idea that um, once you know what your policy should be, um, it's pretty straightforward to express that uh, top down, so you should be able to um, more or less express it in the way you would with you know normal in normal language. So I require an approval to be in a valid time in a valid network, and then uh, break it down and, and implement it. And when you think about uh, how things are matched. Uh, they are all um, yeah um, in in whatever order. So that's. Just to give you a bit of an impression of what uh, OPA is, is capable of doing, and that it's really general purpose. It's nothing to do with Kubernetes per se. It's nothing to do uh, with security or whatever. You can use it literally for any kind of policy decision. Now, the question is, how uh, do you use it? And before we get into the, the actual how to use it programmatically, uh, let's have a look at um, what probably most of you would be familiar with, and that is Kubernetes. So an example I put together here is um, we want to enforce the security good practice that you should be using a dedicated service account for an app. And you know, our interpretation here is that we only talk, talk about deployments. Of course, you would, um, in a real world situation, you would also uh, look after, have to match uh, stateful sets and daemon sets, et cetera. But in our case, or for our purposes, we define as a deployment equals an app, and the existence of a service account name, um, if that is set and that is not default, um, then uh, if it's if it's uh, not set, then it's using the the um, default service account, and that means we have a violation. So how do we get there? Well, first of all, I have three deployments here, and these deployments. Um, they're just uh, dummy deployments that just sit there and sleep. For the first two, I have a service account defined. And for the third, I don't have a service account defined, which means it's using the default service account, right? So if I look at that um, from uh, the CLI point of view, here I have my three deployments. And as I said earlier on, OPA requires you to provide the JSON as input, so let's output it in JSON, right? So that would be the input for uh, Rego. I have already OPA. I have already um, got the input here. I'm going to take that as a whole and um, open up a new playground and put it into the input here. So this is um, the output of the kubectl get deploy. Um, and now I will use that Rego And that is essentially what we just had here um, as the kind of business level description of use a dedicated service account, right? So what we require is that there is not something in the template spec that is the field service account name, and then we pull out the name of that deployment, right? So at the end of the day, we would expect uh, to have um, service account name is unsafe. Okay. Um, it 
is that so? Okay. I'm just gonna do it locally. I don't want to debug. It's gonna have to debug that we're here. Right. Um, so it's on the deployment to that would violate this uh, using this default service account. Um, here you see already one of the example integrations I'm going to talk about in a moment. So this is a VS Code plugin, um, usually more or less the same capability as the playground. Uh, I don't know what, what happened in the playground now, but I don't have the time to debug it now. Okay, so this example should show you a little bit that um, you can get JSON from pretty much anywhere. Uh, when it is API obviously being one one good place, but pretty much anything that gives you JSON is good as an input for, for OPA there. Now talking about um, how you actually gonna use it, and there you have essentially two options. Uh, docs um, give you more um, about that. On the one hand, you can use the built-in HTTP API, so you're running OPA as a service somewhere, could be a sidecar or whatever. Um, one of the examples there, cube management is is such an example that's using the, the API. Um, or if you, so that works for any, any kind of programming language, or if you're using um, Go, then you can use it as a package. So there's a nice package in there, uh, Go mod it, and you, you can directly use it. Um, I have put together a, a little example that's essentially a side arrange checker that uh, you can have a look at how you can directly use it. Um, most of the more, um, you know, system production settings use this HTTP API. Um, you can get then pretty much uh, flexible in terms of how you scale it, how you manage this OPA service if you have a centralized one or um, yeah, as a sidecar. But these are the two options um, for any kind of program language, uh, usually HTTP API or REST API. And for Go, you have the additional option to use it directly as a package. All right, now let's switch gears now that we know all about OPA and talk about the supply chain in or with GitOps. Obviously, we need the code repo. We have some kind of CI pipeline going on that as an artifact uh, spits out uh, the container image, puts it in the registry, and we have the config repo. As I said, conceptually, you could have a branch. Um, I assume that you know the basics of GitOps, and I don't have to <laughs> explain too much here. Um, and in the config repo, you would have things like, for example, Helm in there, or um, currently, uh, YAML, whatever that describes your, your setup, your deployments, your PDs, your whatever. And um, across the entire supply chain, you can uh, make use of that policy uh, and, and OPA. And uh, let's have a look at concrete examples. Here. So for example, what we've already seen earlier on in VS Code, it could be part of uh, the environment where you're, you're editing, where you can uh, do quick test runs and see how a certain policy works. It could be part um, of the repository or extended repository, for example, a bot or an action. It could be part of the pipeline, of the CI pipeline. We submit something and get some notification uh, to see how the, the overall testing has been going. Or it could be part of the runtime environment, so Kubernetes, for example. Um, as I said, this editor plugin, uh, pretty handy. It has a few limitations, but I'm um, using it for, for um, development uh, pretty, pretty often. It's directly part of, of the open policy agent top level. Um, in, uh, in a repo, in a Git repo, GitHub, GitLab, or whatever, in a CI environment, um, you can use a few examples here. The one is from Instrumenta, the conf test action, conf test uh, being a program that allows you to use uh, Rego programmatically against any kind of many, many su supported different versions. Um, and in this case, uh, folks there put together a very nice GitHub action that you can use. Um, the other one, I believe there was a, a recently a, a blog post um, on WeFworks site about this, this deprecation, uh, essentially capturing the um, deprecations of the Kubernetes API. Um, so no matter if you're if you're looking at you know rules themselves or uh, you know something that allows you to use it in, in the context of either um, part of a pull request, you could for example say. Um, before even a human uh, looks at uh, something, you have a bot there listening at a, for example, um, 
omit and uh, applying certain rules there automatically. And um, if you have any kind of violation, if you're using an outdated uh, field or if you um, you know, violate in, against any of the, the standards that your team might have set, um, the, the bot will mark that and uh, you have to fix that before a human actually looks at that at all. And last but not least, um, in the runtime environment and there, uh, I would argue that most prominently it's Gatekeeper uh, nowadays. Again, it's on top level, uh, open policy agent, um, GitHub organization. And the idea there is to provide a Kubernetes native um, way to do policy auditing and policy enforcement. So the inside there, um, I have a, a really great deep dive a CNCF webinar uh, at the end in the resources. So um, you don't really need, need to remember a lot here. The basic idea of Gatekeeper is essentially this one. So rather than everyone who is you know, developing, deploying, whatever in that uh, Kubernetes cluster, having to learn Rego and how to write and, and um, use these, these um, rules, you can kind of uh, separate these concerns. You can use native uh, Kubernetes uh, resources, CRDs essentially, uh, custom resources there, um, you have these so-called templates and only, you know, maybe a handful, maybe only one person has to actually be able to write these templates and actually with that has to be able to write and read um, Rego itself. And then, you know, everyone else would use a custom resource that is based on that and essentially it just parameterizes that. It says in this case, um, the required um, constraint here or violation is that every label, um, every, sorry, every namespace uh, must have a certain, uh, certain label here. And um, as I said, given that you have a separation of concerns, um, you now have a lot of people who can, in a Kubernetes native way, uh, use and, and apply these constraints and these, uh, these requirements and, and enforce these policies and only a handful or a very small part actually needs to explicitly learn how to express those in, in, in Rego there. Um, how, the way how it works is essentially um, Gatekeeper sits uh, in the API server um, or as, as an extension point in the API server as a so-called validating admission webhook that essentially gets uh, the, the last stage before it's one of almost the last stage before it's written into etcd, um, gets uh, the, the uh, resource that's that's cre being created there and um, has a look at that, um, checks it against uh, the, the uh, rule set here. And if it's um, if it passes, if there are no violations, it essentially allows uh, write, writing the API server writing that to etcd and otherwise it rejects that and gives you as the person who issues that creation, um, this, um, this feedback and says, for example, in this case, there is a label missing. Uh, in this case, the, the actual message would be, you must provide labels, and then uh, whatever is missing here. So um, I would argue that looking at Slack and Stack Overflow in many places that most people these days, uh, when they hear about OPA, probably know it from Gatekeeper. They pretty much start with Gatekeeper, and that's great. I am a big fan of Gatekeeper. It's a great community. It's done an awesome job. Um, and I like the, the separation of concerns. The only thing that I would argue is that if you only know Gatekeeper, you probably don't know the full power of OPA. And I hope that with the examples that we looked at in the beginning, that you have an idea that um, it is not constrained to communities. It is not constrained to, you know, um, check if certain, you know, uh, image has come from a certain um, repository or whatever. You can do anything and everything you want. And uh, projects such as Gatekeeper make it very, very uh, simple and easy for or pretty much everyone to use it because they don't really have to learn Rego per se, but simply uh, use what they already know how to use. And these are uh, resources in Kubernetes. All right, with that, um, just a couple of, of resources. There are a number of nice videos. Uh, as I said, uh, there's this webinar. If you want to learn more about uh, Gatekeeper, um, the first one is a 
really awesome deep dive on open policy agent by uh, one of the founders of the company Stira behind uh, OPA that donated that to CNCF. And that's a, a um, podcast I recently did um, with, with some folks that uh, worked on, on deprecation. Um, cooling, as I said, there is a wonderful um, playground there and definitely have a look at kind of test as well. And a couple of, of great articles that uh, give you a bit of a feeling where and how um, OPA is, is used uh, throughout. And with that, um, I hope we still have a few minutes for uh, Q&A. Yes. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, if anybody joined later, these usually run about 30 to 45 minutes, so we're at the 32 minute mark, so we can definitely take a few questions and uh, okay. uh, move forward. By the way, so yes, as people are thinking, please um, post your chat, uh, post your questions in the chat box. Uh, I asked people where they were from, and we had a, an ordinate number of people from Germany, some from Berlin, one from Ireland, one from Tunisia. A couple of people from Belgium, <laughs> so we we're just chatting and some people are saying hello. So we seem to have gotten okay. a bit of a contingent there. So yeah, um, please let us know, uh, what are your thoughts? Any particular questions or uh, was there anything particular that you were hoping to learn from this talk and uh, maybe some areas where we'd uh, have Michael de um, dive a little deeper? Uh, cool. We have Walter. So we have one before. question. Cool. Let yeah. me post Walter's hey. chat to everybody because I don't think everybody can see. Okay. So, so I can Walter's I can see on. it. It says, okay. uh, so. "How does Opal work with Service Mesh?" Yes. Great. So um, yes, the slides will be available. I, I'll share that uh, and it's available right away. Um, so in a sense, Opal doesn't really have anything to do with service meshes, right? You can um, think about how you want to enforce it with a service mesh. Um, and, and again, uh, this is mainly a, a matter of how you want to integrate that. So you could, for example, use, I'm still screen sharing, right? So you could, mm -hmm. um, if we go back here to um, the docs, there is an very nice um, integration with Envoy. So you could, um, Envoy being uh, used very often as the data plane of service meshes, Istio, AppMesh, etc. Um, you could use uh, that Envoy integration here, which um, it, you know might be a little low level. I would always approach it from the um, perspective of who do you expect uh, writing these rego, these, these rules, and how or who is going to apply them. Meaning that if you are more in the spectrum where gatekeepers, where you want to provide something native, in this, in this case, Kubernetes native, you want to abstract away all the details, you want to essentially provide a set of rules that people can apply. Um, then you know you probably end up with something like like a gatekeeper, right? You want something that um, you know you, people use a high level abstraction. If uh, you're fine with that, people directly express their um, their rules in, in Rego, then you probably have more options there. Uh, Envoy, as I said, the integration there is is uh, existent, and, and you can use that. Um, and I definitely uh, see that there is a lot of, of um, things that you can uh, do and, and that would make sense to do in, in service measures. Excellent. Uh, we have a question from DM asking if there's an example of using OPA for Azure policy. Policy files are in JSON there. I'm looking to get started on a demo with that. Right. So I am not entirely sure what you mean with Azure policy. Uh, is that something like specific around? I'm, I'm not familiar with, with, with Azure policy, what, what that is. But as long as it's in JSON, you can use it as an input. Right? I don't know if it's saying policy to control human. Azure. Oops, sorry, it's sliding off. Lots of questions here. Policy to control Azure resource deployments. Right. Um, I would have to have a look at if, if there is something uh, out there. I haven't come across it myself. 
Um, but um, definitely what I would probably do is on Slack uh, joining the um, Open Policy Agent uh, Slack and, and ask there. Um, I can take that that as a note as well to see, uh, ask around there if you if you can do that. So I, I personally I, I'm not familiar with with that. I don't have any examples there. But as I said, as long as it's JSON, it can be used as an input. Nice. Good. Uh, AJ asks, what are the most commonly used policies you've seen across customers? Uh, one of the policies that we use is allowing internal container image registries. Right, right, right. It, it very much depends on um, what what kind of um, you know where exactly in the supply chain. Right, you have a lot of of those um, you know general purpose things. Um, if you look at Kubernetes, that's exactly this kind of of what what you've seen there. Right, you say um, it has to be from a certain uh, registry or or uh, signed off by a certain uh, set of of uh, developers or whatever. Um, so that's one of those, what I would say, more technical supply chain management, but there are also other um, business related ones. So higher level things that um, might, might, uh, you know, might be relevant and, and you can use, you can use it for both, right? You can, uh, you probably, they come from different people. So, uh, you know, the, the more higher level business related workflow related ones, uh, are defined by, um, you know, groups that, that, uh, have a more general view on, on the, the whole workflow, whereas the technical ones come from more, uh, infra people or whatever. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I've seen both, both being used. Cool. Excellent. Sebastian asks, do you have an example of, uh, GitOps OPA integration, for example, a repo where we can see how the policies are applied via GitOps? So I think the the um, a really nice example I had there was from Constest. The, the um, yes, and yeah, Jan uh, shares that as well. <laughs> says check the Constest examples. Yeah, it was probably a little quick earlier on. Let me get you. Where do we have the Constest example? There you go. So that, that being, um, go here. But this, in this case, it's specifically um, a GitHub action. Um, and here it's essentially abstracted away. So here you just need to say, you know, where, where is your policy? Where is your rego file? Um, and um, you can use that GitHub action directly as any other GitHub action. So that would be uh, one concrete um, way how to use it. Awesome. We have Nikolai who asks, That's what the was most the most unexpected or funniest yet reasonable application of OPA that you've seen yet? I've, uh, I've heard people, I think it was some lobsters or whatever, mm -hmm. when I originally developed this one here to just to play around with um, with uh, Rego, um, where is it here? No, this one here. Um, and that is the decider checker, right? And essentially what it does is you provide, um, you can do three things. You can either check if uh, um, a certain IP is contained in, in a CIDR range or if two CIDR ranges overlap or, or you can use it generated. And you know this is probably something that people would not necessarily associate with with uh, OPA uh, in the first place. But it 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 is a, a valid use case. Right in this case, the the actual you know rule uh, that the Rego module is is hard coded. You could also imagine loading that uh, at, at runtime. Um, but yeah, I heard some some interesting comments on that. Um, and it's valid, right? It it works as you know, it's maybe a little bit. Uh, over the top and, and <laughs> over oversized, but it works. Cool. Uh, Andreas asks, "What's your experience with error feedback in GitOps pipelines when policies are checked only in the runtime stage? How do you deal with partial applies due to policy validations?" Yeah, so that's a that's an interesting one because um, I get that also sometimes when when people say, "Hey, you know, if you 
look at the supply chain here. And if you have everything covered in the early phases, right? So let's say either up until here or here, then what's the point? So that's kind of like the extension of why do you actually have to you know, check anything in, in the runtime, right? But yes, in, in theory, that's true. But in practice, you always have to deal with heterogeneous environments. So you might have a shared cluster where some teams are using GitOps and some others are not yet there. So you simply do not have all the state in, uh, in, in Git as you would expect. Um, so you maybe are forced to, to actually check what is, what is running there. Um, it could also be different versions or whatever, but the, the bottom line is, unfortunately, you know, um, we have to deal with, with reality and reality means that there are always cases where um, you know, not all the state is as expected in, in Git uh, for a variety of reasons. And um, so it is this combination. It's a bit like with security, this, this layered security model defense in depth, um, where you have multiple layers in the same way here. Um, you want to make sure if you want to be compliant and you know, there might be a fine or whatever, if you're not compliant, um, then you want to make extra sure that uh, nothing slips through and then, you know, making maybe even the same thing in, in multiple places um, is, is actually something people do. Great. And uh, Tobia asks, are OPA policies also applied to get and list requests using gate? So uh, Tobia is using gatekeeper with Kubernetes right now. So can, uh, can you use OPA policies? Um, so I'm not 100% certain because it's, it's only validating the current moment. Um, I'm not an ex an gatekeeper expert enough to 100% say yes or no. But as far as I remember, it was only in creation of, of, uh, of a resource and not in, in the read path. Mm -hmm. Need to double check um, probably in, on Slack. There is a, a dedicated, um, it's not called uh, Gatekeeper, it's called Kubernetes Policy, uh, but there is a dedicated uh, channel on the OPA Slack. And it is actually pronounced OPA. So I was, for the longest time, I was kind of like uh, unsure um, as well. And I hear a lot of people struggling saying OPA or whatever it is, OPA. And the reason why I know that is because a the people who wrote it have done that. They actually said it on, you know, on camera. And even if you go to open policy agent, um, it actually says it directly in the beginning here, right? It literally says pronounced OPA. Since <laughs> right? so, so, I, I used to say Rego and actually it's pr pronounced Rego. So I know it's a bit strange, especially for me, someone who uh, is mother, um, German uh, OPA has a, a funny connotation. It's called uh, it's uh, in German that's a uh, grandfather, right? So it's the what? But it's OPA. I didn't know uh, what you said. OPA. Oh, oh, OPA grandfather. Is oh. grandfather. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, um, so we have someone here who's uh, trying to get their team uh, aware and on board with uh, OPA. So what do you think is a good, easy, quick win or starting point to introduce the team? Um, yeah, that's using Kubernetes to, to get to OPA, especially if they're completely unaware of OPA. Right. Um, so the thing is, on the one hand, the docs are so awesome that if you just go through uh, the language here and they have very consistent uh, examples and, and they, they are live, you can them out together with the the playground where you know you have wonderful examples here for everything right so you can just go here and say like okay uh, i'm interested in role-based access control or what is going on with envoy here roles or whatever um the playground is so great that you could just play around with that if you know a, a, a good idea very quickly um the the three videos that i i pointed out depending on for for whom um if you want to learn more about the background you know the philosophy and, and why are things done that way um the the, the one from torin um or uh, gatekeeper um this the second one uh here um let me 
and uh, these two videos again. So for more technical people or people who actually really want to um, write Rego and, and learn about the background, this, this uh, deep dive um, from, from Torin, um, or this webinar um, that really goes into all exactly how Gatekeeper works, et cetera. And it's very recent, I think two weeks old or whatever. Um, so these two videos as a start, and then um, I would say the dogs, using the dogs and, and the playground, um, getting getting started there. And then it's a matter of um, doing something small, um, usually some kind of, of green field, um, something where you, you know, maybe something that is not totally business critical that you plan to do anyways, and that is, that is new, where you can, uh, if it's written in gold and you can directly use it or otherwise, uh, you know, just a small application of that to see uh, how all these things work together. And there are so many things in there, um, you know, anything from, um, you can uh, export from these uh, metrics and you have debugging and, and tooling there. It's, it's a really very powerful uh, ecosystem. So you can really very nicely develop stuff. Um, but as I said, I, I would start uh, mainly with the dogs and the, the playground. It's, it's really in such a great state that um, it usually, um, if you get over this initial, um, you know, um, it, it, it looks slightly different and you have to have this mindset from, as I said, CSS or XSLT uh, being, you know, that's the closest to, in, in my experience in terms of just pattern matching rather than uh, imperatively saying what's going on there. Mm. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I think. Mm. So Bala asks if they, you have any suggestions or tips for including network policy and pod security policy as part of OPA itself. So um, the thing is for PSPs, uh, OPA was already suggested and, and uh, I'm, keeping an eye on that and definitely interested in if we can maybe um, replace the current PSP to pod security policies with um, a set of, of OPA rules. I would be definite, uh, definitely a, a, a big fan to see that. And um, if, you, if you're interested in that, uh, I'm, I'm definitely happy to, to toy around with that um, or help out uh, making that happen. Network policies, um, they're pretty much established. I don't I? I would say that um, taking network policies as an input um, is something that that makes sense. And if you like, when I say input, then, then I essentially mean um, in the same way that I'm currently toying around with something called Binomia, which is essentially trying to unify our AWS IAM um, policies with with RBAC so that you can. Um, have a unified way to query stuff. So you have on the one hand, um, everything from, you know, what nodes are in there and what, what policies are in there. And on the other hand, everything that's running um, in the Kubernetes or EKS cluster. And then you can, um, you know, define your, um, your rules on, based on that. And that's, that's, that's how I would see the, the network policies there as an input there, but not necessarily to replace that. You could, you could replace these policies, but for uh, network policies are stable, right? They are uh, already established. PSPs uh, didn't make it to GA and there is this question, will they? Um, and that's where I would definitely be all for, you know, as a next step replacing PSPs with uh, semantically equivalent in, in OPA, but uh, network policies, I would see them just as an input for your overall policies. Awesome. Well, I think that gets to the end of our questions. And thanks also to everyone cool. who added some comments and uh, shared information with each other. Really appreciate your time, Michael. It was really great. great. And, uh, Thank you so much for having me. Yes, and I guess um, so for people who joined, uh, you'll get an email follow up and I guess Stacy will follow up with you maybe with some of those links as well as the link to your slides. You mentioned that you'll be posting them somewhere. So sounds like you have a lot of great resources. Um, and yes, the uh, we record all these they go onto our Weaveworks YouTube channel, which also will be included in the follow up email. So if you're looking to share the video of Michael, then uh, you'll get that right after this. So I will share my closing uh, slides, if I can go find them here. Yes, 
Hopefully everybody can see my closing slides. So as I mentioned, if this is your first time, uh, this is our Weave online user group. It's uh, regularly, generally on Tuesdays at 10 a.m. Pacific time and AS 6 p.m. Uh, UK time. Uh, and you can obviously watch it globally around the world. Uh, heads up for these are our upcoming events, including uh, we'll be doing a quick turnaround on this GitOps Days event that we're putting together and we'll be posting in the next day or two. We've got some great speakers, including Kelsey Hightower. So we're very excited to have a conversation around GitOps. So those are the two days. And of course, it's an online event and we hope to see you there. You'll get more information about that shortly. So thanks again to Michael and Stacy, and thanks to all of you. I'll see you guys next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.